English is a globally renowned language. It's spoken by the most number of people in this world, but also it's spoken by the most egalitarian societies in this world, the most economically sound societies in this world, and the most financially solvent societies in this world. For far too long have we created arbitrary principles that define what language should mean to this world. We change that and we break them from opening government. A couple of principles to like start off this debate. First, we think language in general should be utility-based rather than like individual, like protecting individual restrictions and freedoms. Why so? For first, from opening government, we do not restrict freedom of speech, individual means of expression. We're completely okay with using your ethnic language for conversations at home, your own livelihoods, your families, etc., etc. But the arbitrary necessity for all of those things to translate into things that concern the national fabric, academia, politics, and trade is a logical link that's always been missing. We think if language can never serve a purpose for our lives, we're, mar we're far better using an alternative language that does so. Secondly, we don't think this policy is exclusionary because the status quo is often exclusionary. The languages that countries use are often the majority spoken that often exclude the most minorities and vulnerable groups at best, we use a language that's exclusionary to all people in the country and all people face equal effort in learning that language. We don't think this is exclusionary. Third, we think like trade, politics, academia should not be a national effort in principle but should be a global effort. Because in the improvement of academia, in the improvement of political ideals, in the best case scenario of trade, the ones that get excluded are the ones that fail to connect. We, in principle, will show to you that the best way is to ensure a global effort for all of these factors in the world that systematically improve the threshold for all of these things. But fourth, we think there's like we break the biggest problem that races in general face. Because the only division that exists in this world is due to like you not being able to relate to other people. This happens because of things such as different skin colors. This happens because of things such as different clothes, different like ideals, ways of life. There's no commonality between an African individual living in uh, the Congo and someone in Asia or living in Russia. The one thing that can possibly connect all of these people and break those racial barriers is a commonality that exists in the way you speak, is in the language you speak. So for the first time ever, we're okay with breaking those racial arbitrary barriers for a barrier that connects all of these people. The conclusion of all of these principles are the status quo has an arbitrary over-glorification of ethnic language. We aim to break them for utilitarian benefits. Before that, yeah. Given that using the language is incredibly important to preserve culture in academia. Do you think that the propagation and preservation of your particular language is highly uh, compromised with yourself? We don't understand the necessity of using one language to discuss and preserve another. We also don't understand why preserving that academia it comes at the trade-off of all of the harms we're about to talk to you about in our speech. So, like, first, why is it so important? And at best, we're okay with like we're okay to bite the bullet and trade it off, even though we don't. We're okay to trade it off to a certain extent. Why is it so very important? Because we improve a lot of countries that are currently underprivileged in the status quo. In all three aspects: academia, trade, politics. How does this happen? First, we think in academia, the biggest problem that a lot of countries face is access. Access to knowledge that is systematically created and only available to certain groups of people that are unfairly benefited by their national fabric because they're taught to speak and taught to learn in a specific language. The best kinds of journals and the best kinds of books with the best researchers in this world just often to be in English. Meaning, on a primary level, if we allow English to exist in these societies, you get greater access to further knowledge that you currently don't have access to. On a primary level, this creates a more educated society. Secondly, we think, the, we often over-romanticize Western society, but never fully adopt the proper ideals we're supposed to from those societies, but either automatically assume all their ideals are good, or automatically disengage from all their ideas completely. You either have two extremes. One where you automatically assume America and everything it does is great, or the other extreme where you automatically disengage from America because you're hostile, you're alien to them, you don't quite understand who these people are. So first, understanding academia and English for the first time ever allows you to critically analyze Western society, its values, and the way in which it improves its academia. Meaning, you're less likely to 
blindly follow Western ideals, living in a conservative society in Asia, but also you're less likely to completely disengage from Western society because of arbitrary things such as a war that happened 200 years ago and you feel alien to them. Meaning, you create a connection that allows you to empathize and understand all of these societies. You understand what's wrong with their societies, but also what's right, and take the best out of that academia. But third, you allow joint effort into research and development. Because a lot of restriction to research and knowledge is the fact that you don't share that knowledge with other people and you have no means of sharing that knowledge. Meaning, you as an individual living in a village in Bangladesh are afraid of what a white person coming in into your forest does to your forest because that's your source of livelihood. Having a means to communicate allows you to empathize with that. But more so, you're likely to create a joint effort between countries in improving the overall academia that defines this work. Meaning, which in this way you allow the overall development of certain attributes and certain facets of knowledge in specific areas and across borders. Conclusion being, your best kind of academia is one that's a joint effort conglomerated between both. Trade. We think you form better ties and relationships when you're often allowed to communicate with people that you currently don't communicate with. You set up businesses and are easier to facilitate businesses when you have an incentive to set up in a particular area. When you know for a fact it's not completely like uh, alien to you and you have an ability to go into those areas. The worst case scenario in our world is these people who want to create trade, want to have ambitions, do learn English, but the problem with that is they leave their native country, lead to a brain drain, a capital flight, never come back. Because they feel like English has no space in their own country. They feel like it's something that has to be deserted for them to succeed in life. For the first time ever, we create incentives for these individuals to not see their own country as one they have to desert for their personal ambitions, but one they can incorporate into their daily lives, use as a means of improvement. But even in terms of politics, you create the best kinds of individual inspirations. When you follow the best ideals from abroad, relate to them because you're also connected to this through the academia I talked about. You understand the nature of political parties. You understand the ideals that are behind them. The conclusion of all of this analysis is you understand and you connect the world that creates the best kinds of connected academia, trade and politics. It's about time we broke arbitrary barriers that divides people. Very glad to close. Madam, Mr. Speaker, despite being in my fourth year of debating, I might stutter quite a bit in this speech and that's an argument in favor of the opposition. Because we think the side that opening government wants to support is an exclusionary world in which people, uh, in, in which the means of social mobility are blocked to people within the same country. We want a world in which people speak languages that they are, speak not native languages and the government facilitates those languages as a medium of commerce, as a medium of academia in those societies. I'm gonna give you three arguments in this speech. First of all, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why language and learning English is inaccessible to a lot of people in many countries and there are harms that flow from that. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, I want to look to you why that harms and directly militates against the local culture and the native culture, which is a thing that people might want to protect. And thirdly, I'll tell you why Western academia or the hegemony of Western academia is dangerous and it's important to allow other forms of academia to prosper. Yeah, yeah. Before that, a number of rebuttals, right? They said that language should be utilitarian. It should like, there shouldn't be other reasons for preferring language rather than utility. But utility can be a number of things, right? Often people derive subjective utility from being able to be part of a certain culture. They derive subjective utility from being able to communicate in a language that they feel is their own and not have something imposed on them. So we think they can't just say that and say that economic benefits are the only thing that they want to talk about, right? They said next that all people on our side need to put in equal effort to learn English, and that's a good thing. But we don't think that's true, and I'll demonstrate that the people who are the least privileged in these societies have to put in the most effort to put, learn these languages, and these barriers are often insurmountable for them, right? They said then that it's important to break barriers between people living in Asia and people living in Africa. But we think it's very unlikely that you as a person, as an Indian, will ever interact with a person living in like someplace in Africa, but you are much more likely to interact with an Indian living like next door. It's much more important to facilitate that kind of communication rather than this arbitrary uh, principle argument from them. Sit down. They then said that it's very important 
for Western journals to be popular because they tend to be the, uh, the best journals, Mr. Speaker. Absolute Orientalist bullshit, Mr. Speaker, coming from that side because we think people in India and people in Philippines are, are like smart and like perfectly capable of producing the kinds of journals and the kind of critical literature that allow people to prosper in society, right? We think often this becomes a self-fulfilling prop prophecy at the point where the governments impose this and don't, uh, don't allow the local journalism, etc., to prosper. Okay. They next said that reading Western literature allows you to critically analyze these kinds of things so that you can not just wholesale bind to Western thought, also critically analyze. If that were true, Mr. Speaker, then reading with Western literature would have produced that same effect in Western societies as well. Actually, it's produced the opposite effect, right? It has allowed people, it has allowed people to just buy wholesale into the narratives of capitalism and the neoliberal consensus in those societies, right? Finally, on this issue of research and trade, we think those things can be facilitated by the provision of translators, etc. And the global community has an incentive in allowing research and trade to happen. So they will put up with those kinds of facilitations. It, it, it's not clear why you have to wholesale change, like, like impose one language on everybody else. I'll take closing before I move on to my points. Yes. So in the absence of having, of adopting English as a national language, what is the converse? Will you still choose a national language or will you allow people to remain in pockets and choose their own languages? Yeah, we allow people to remain in pockets and choose their own languages. It's not as bad as that sounds. It means that vast geographical areas speak the same language, often united by religion, and the discourse between different communities happens in the same way as we've described, right? Can happen yeah, yeah. to translators, etc. In, in those ways. First of all, Mr. Speaker, why is language inaccessible? Like just learning English inaccessible for a number of people, right? We think language is not like facts of the world that you can tell people at any age and they will just like be able to buy into it and be able to be experts in those fields. We think often children are just hardwired to be able to add a, like, at a very young age pick up language and learn language in a way that uh, adults cannot. That means that to make our, our adults like learn a language, which is a second language, Mr. Speaker, you have to put in vast amounts of effort in education. You have to like, make, uh, like you have to have like all English schools, Mr. Speaker, and, and that, that incurs huge costs on the government, which we don't think is often like very possible for the government to do, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, right? We think, you see, you see the status quo in places, sit down, no, I'm, I'm not going to take any more. You see the status quo in places such as India, right? You've got often makeshift schools in Indian villages, which aren't able, even able to get like any teachers to provide like even basic schooling. It's one headmaster of the school who's teaching all subjects in those schools, Mr. Speaker, right? These are countries where like the government is not able to provide like like proper food and like basic amenities for the farmers. How would you expect to allow an educational system that gets the best like English educated teachers who are teaching English, Mr. Speaker? And the thing is this, you don't really need just one English teacher in these classrooms to teach the English language. You often need every single person, the person who teaches mathematics, the person who teaches science, to also be educated in English because we think that's the only atmosphere in which you are able to simulate the kind of environment people are able to learn l language as a like very intimate thing, right? We think there are huge co harms to this, Mr. Speaker. At the point where only the richest of your society are able to afford these kinds of things, we think you exclude everybody else and there are huge harms that flow from that. First of all, Mr. Speaker, the first is the issue of elitism that happens in many countries such as India, right? We think people like Mitra look down upon, uh, look down upon me because I can't speak English in the same way that he can, even though he's... Yeah, and we think that might sound funny, but when that happens to a poor villager in India who moves to Delhi and is looked down upon as made fun of because of his accent, because of the way that he cannot speak English, Mr. Speaker, that's a huge harm that doesn't allow these communities to ever mingle, Mr. Speaker. It like perpetuates the superiority of the upper class and the inferiority of the lower class. So here's the second harm that I want to talk about. Often people coming from villages limit themselves in the kinds of things that they can do because they feel that they can never compete with these people if they can't do this, Mr. Speaker. It is true. Uh, like my pain struggle of being uh, like being in the med medical field and being in the medical field and like feeling inferior when everybody around them was talking in English was usually problematic for them, right? Oftentimes it was a huge discouraging influence pushing them, often making them feel that they should move away from this because this is not meant for this, Mr. Speaker. We think that's usually problematic. The third harm is this, Mr. Speaker, in the form of political discourse. When like, English becomes a language of like political discourse in times now, etc., it's very hard for people to be able to participate in that, the local villages. So only the elite control that discourse, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to talk about why academia dominated by Western thought is also harmful, Mr. Speaker. Because often, like, you need to, like, support academia of the local language center to allow it to per persist, to uh, allow it to preserve, right? That side doesn't do that and only wants Western academia. The first harm of that is just there's less diversity of thought in the world, right? It's only Western philosophers who are dominating the entire, like, academic, like, like, academic thought. And you don't read of people like Prem Chin or Chanakya, Mr. Speaker, who are important Indian philosophers who have thoughts that can match those kinds of things, like, that 
that come from unique experiences of these people, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. So we think that is, like, firstly, in and of itself, that diversity is good. But secondly, Western thought is bad because it perpetuates structures of capitalism, etc., as we see empirically too. Virat is going to talk about, talk more about that. Very proud of course. <laughs> The opening opposition has never shown us how in a world where we don't prioritize English in academia and all the main facets of, like, uh, of our daily lives, how elitism, which is based on your fluency in English, is ever likely to go away. Thing is, if you, if you don't prioritize English as your chief language, the more affluent in the society are more likely to learn English anyway because they recognize that all your opportunities internationally and locally and for you to become dominant individuals in your respective society is still based on your ability to learn English. But the problem remains that you don't trickle down this narrative to the poor who still believe that their ability to succeed is contingent on their ability to learn the local language, which means that you disproportionately deny them the ability or give them the false hope that they can still succeed by remaining in their individual pockets knowing their local cultures only, whereas their influences, their expressions will only remain confined to their individual societies and will travel no more. We think we would like to equally preserve the cultures and the languages and the experience of these individuals as the opposition, as the opposition in this debate today. But we think we do this better when your experiences and when your academia is something that's accessible to the world outside. Because individuals who are unlikely to learn English or unlikely to learn one universal language, you're more likely to have your experiences in a bubble where it doesn't translate to most of the people, which means that nobody really gives a shit about you. We think that's problematic. But even then, we think at any world, I think in, even in the world of the opposition, you force a significant majority of the people to learn a language that isn't native to them, which means that you shift to national languages anyway, which is forceful on a lot of minorities that live in these individual countries. We think the world is better when you force everyone to learn English, because even if you wish to discriminate individuals based on accents, in our world, everybody is likely to have accents, everybody is likely to face similar struggles when when it comes to learning this particular language, we think that is a far more egalitarian society. But then, op opening opposition thinks that we will just blindly follow the end and we will just blindly subscribe to all of the Western ideals as soon as we learn English. One of the biggest critiques of the entire like Western ideology of what colonial colonialism stands for and their version of politics is an Indian politician by the name of Shashi Tharoor who knows better English than like probably many scholars in like the biggest universities in England because we think because individuals like these politicians were capable of learning English and critiquing criticizing these individuals based on their home language is the one is the one sort of criticism that gains a greater amount of access in terms of reach and we think that's more important because reach is what enables these individuals to listen to you and to stand to like and to listen to your demands when you're out there but understand this in our in, in the world of the opposition poor people are like hurt more and we think that's problematic but understand this even when when it comes to the aspect of these individual societies and countries recognize that once a significant proportion of your population who are likely to be the ones who are talented and take your country forward, learn English anyway and realize that they aren't able to do a lot with English in their home countries, they automatically leave towards serving institutions abroad which best serve them in that particular language, which leads to brain drain, which leads to capital flight, something that the entire opposition was absolutely reluctant to engage at all, we think it's far more problematic. But even when, we, even when they tell us that it's important to preserve local academia when it comes to, when it comes to, like, to their native language, we think we do this better because Individuals are more likely to gain access to academia with English because we think we isolate a lot of individuals by this forceful adaptation that takes place at a point of time because you spent a significant portion of your childhood learning math, learning science in one particular language and then when you think of expanding your ambitions, expanding what you wish to do with your life and have an overarching purpose, you're forced to learn another language which you're incapable of. What you need to recognize is, at the end of the day, you will not be able to change the fact that English is the most 
more popular language overall in the world, that is something that you're unlikely to change with your belief and with your arbitrary romanticization of your home language. It's about time that you move on and create a calculus based on, uh, like, like based on an understanding of English that serves everyone better. But understand this, social mobility is best served in our world, where you are likely to invite minorities to participate in discussions better. Because firstly, their language is English, something that's internationally and locally accessible, which means that their voices transcend to everyone within that particular sphere. But even then, even if there are structural barriers involved, which stops minorities from being able to explore their to the full extent of their democratic rights, we think as long as your voice transcends to international authorities, you're more likely to garner sympathy from institutions and individuals outside who can come to your help. But more importantly, you're more likely to assimilate into societies where best of the opportunities exist when you know English. The main reason why refugees Fleeing from like war-torn areas can't really assimilate into countries outside. The reason why they are perceived as aliens, because the most tangible, most visceral reaction of these individuals is that these people are different because these people speak differently. Yes. French philosophers, yes, Sartre, Foucault, Derrida, have been able to heavily influence their support, even though they weren't finally right in English. Why do you think the same can happen to all the other developing sides? Yeah, but because we think that the overarching ability of these individuals to have their voices transcend to international community is something that's limited when they don't learn English. We think that's a hierarchy that we have created because of the solvency of certain communities who already know English. And you can't, since you can't solve this disparity overnight, the best way is to have your versions translated to English or you place better effort in learning English because that is what enables these individuals to go outside. So at the end of the day, what has the opening government proven to you? We think the inability or like the overarching prioritization on your local language makes you reluctant to learn English, which is a more internationally accessible or like language, which means that you have an over, which means that communities and individuals force you to stay away from the biggest of opportunities that are out there, force you to stay in your individual pockets because they make you romanticize about something that doesn't really have any value. We shift that discussion to one that is based on a utilitarian calculus. We increase social mobility and we preserve cultures better because in our world, only these experiences are internationally and universally accessible and felt in their world. They're just trapped within pockets. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, three things in this speech. Firstly, inaccessibility and how it causes stratification of society. Secondly, continuation of Western imperialism and Western thought onto local nations. And lastly, on domestic politics and whether we give any voice to people within that country. But before that, let's talk about what happens in our world, right? Because I don't think opening government or the government bench in general got things clear. We think our world looks like more like 1960s, 1970s India, where political discussion had in multiple, multiple languages such as Bengali, Kannada, Hindi, or Uriya, and so on and so forth. We think the constitution exists in all of them. We think official languages and official filing of police complaints or academic work and so on and so forth happens in all these languages. We think that that model applies within our debate and a comparative is that. Under our case, we tell you that national language cannot and will not be pushed onto people as a whole within a nation. Why is that? Because at the point of time where the government decides to prioritize one minority in their language over hundreds of other minorities and other geographical uh, 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 like demographics living within the country, we think the political backlash is too high for them to be able to do so. We think at the point of time where the politics within that country, the demographics within that country, cannot allow this to happen with respect to pushing one national language onto other people, we don't think that will be the case. But before I move on to inaccessibility, let's deal with this one thing about utility and economic utility, right? I think the inability of government bench to conceive Japan as a nation that has gone ahead without adopting English as a national language is what lost them this debate. Because I think Japanese, Japanese individuals and Japanese population, and I work at Nomura, Mr. Speaker, I think is a very successful nation with regards to both economics and research and making the society forward. We think other countries like India, where robust thoughts and discussion in politics, academia and commerce happen in their own local languages, we think that they can go forward as usual and better than possibly adopting English as one, one language that 
like permeates through society. We think the social economic stratification on their side between countries is not just dependent on language. And solving that does not mean that you solve for social economic stratification in brain brain. Because at the point of time where all countries speak English, we still think that other arbitrary barriers such as which country have access to different resources and so on and so forth still exist. What kind of politics and politicians or academicians exist within those countries still exist and people still have the incentive to change countries and to change demographics to move to somewhere with better opportunities. Let's talk about inaccessibility, right? We think OG lost this debate when they assume we do this debate in a hypothetical de developing countries. We think this debate is about countries which have historically been dependent on native languages. That is to say that we can't let them get away with not giving any form of mechanism as to how they're going to make English more accessible and more and give opportunities to people within that nation on how they'll make English a, a common ground for everybody to speak. We think that we told you multiple reasons as to why that cannot be the case and will not be the case. We think it will lead to greater stratification because more effort is needed in order to educate least privileged people as Shaikh told you. We heard no response to Shaikh telling you multiple things like people, uh, like we need academic philosophers or people who speak English and people who social sciences, sciences, and so on and so forth. We think it takes a huge amount of human capital and financial costs on behalf of the government to be able to do so. We think more importantly, it erodes families, right? Because at the point of time where old individuals and people within the family speak different languages and young children have been educated within one particular language, we think the culture of these nations and the families within those nations are now eroded. Because at the point of time where families with, like people within one family or one particular nation uh, or like one particular unit such as a family cannot talk to each other or cannot do not understand the thoughts and ideas that go within each other's minds we think that's bad but more importantly let's talk about continuation of western ideas right we think that ideas and thoughts and how cultures develop go a long way in how political movements develop and how things change within society, how people think of their society and so on and so forth. We think under their side, it limits the potential of ideas that local countries have. There are multiple ideas in Hindi, Mr. Speaker, and multiple concepts which I literally cannot talk about in English because I don't know how to express them in English. The similar way how consent cannot be expressed in Mandarin or Hindi, there are similar ideas and concepts within those languages that cannot be expressed within English. We think those ideas and thoughts are important and need to be developed within those local ideas and those local languages. And I think that once this happens, it's more important and more, more likely that people from abroad and people who study English and dominate the political discourse get to those ideas when they're discussed highly in universities, highly in political landscape and highly in academic landscape. Sit down. We think it actually removes the ability of the individual and the society as a whole to bring these conceptions to the forefront. Because in Prem Chand or Chanakya within India, write certain things and these are discussed in texts within universities. We think it gives more of an incentive to Western philosophers and Western academicians to come down or possibly think about why this is gaining so much traction within those countries that political ideas and logical thought. We think that is when we have people questioning Western, uh, Western ideas and criticizing those ideas better than what opening government suggests, such as reading Western philosophers and so on. Shariq's POI made a lot of sense, right? Because at the point of time where people in the local languages have been historically able to question Western ideas and Western philosophers, we think it's far better on our side. Sit down. Authors and poets and philosophers which have for centuries changed perceptions and furthermore questioned ideas that have come towards them, we think this is some trade-off that we are not able to accept. But more, sit down. We think the development of these cultures, if questioning critical analysis is what we want to achieve, we think we do it far better on our side. And we think that questioning these claims for developing a different form of culture within local language and within local philosophers, we think it's far better on our side. Yes. So your political movements, how will anybody outside want to listen to them if they don't understand what they're talking about? We think that's not the case at the point of time where large hordes of people congregate to, 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 like, to need something or to want something and put their movements forward. We think translators and people who facilitate that discussion already exist. We think political parties have an incentive to do that anyway with regards to like appealing to these individuals and so on and so forth. But this OG mentions Shashi Thru, right? We think that people in India, such as Amartya Sen and Jagdish Bhatia, which, which, like, which like want Western ideologies to come in and which support Western ideologies as opposed to Shashi Thru, do have an equal amount of following and possibly more with respect to their ideas and so on and so forth. So it's not an arbitrary or normative claim that OG can make that we have ideas that are criticized. We think that Shashi Thru's education in not English institutions and being grown up in Kerala under Western imperialism possibly might have more to do with him questioning colonialism than reading English texts. But lastly on domestic politics, right? We think that the ability of people and things that they didn't respond to within OG, and I hope CG does that, is that people within domestic institutions, within domestic political sphere, are not able to opt in into domestic politics. Because at the point we tell you 
that accessibility of English language to each and every individual within that country is so tough that out of order, man, uh, is so tough that people cannot opt into political discourse with that's happening within their nation. We don't think that we don't think domestic politics or stratification of domestic ideologies is something that we can support on our side. I'm very honored to speak here again from opening opposition and this time with my best friend. Take it from someone whose country has been colonized for over 350 years. Colonization sucks. But it gave us a few good things, like a structure upon which we can build a shared mode of communication that can bring together the world. So, we are faced with the reality of globalization. The world is getting smaller, but the way and modes in which we communicate with each other are not adapting to change that. We are being held back by backward notions of regionalism and tribalism that prevent us from being able to come together as a global community. So this is where we extend coming from closing government. The first, we need to come up with a global language. Number two, that global language needs to be English and that all rebuttals will be integrated in my constructive speech. So. First, we need to come up with a global language because this was hinted at coming from the opening themes but never really fleshed out, right? It's really ambiguous and there's a deadlock coming from their side as to whether or not we really need a global language as opposed to a regional one. The first premise I want to propose that may be a little controversial is that in this debate and in most debates, cultural diversity can just go ahead and take a back seat. Opening opposition wants people to stay in pocket communities to preserve this amorphous identity and amorphous no value called diversity without being able to prove why this diversity is absolutely necessary, right? We tell you, coming from closing government, that culture and identity is constructed and it has no intrinsic meaning. It only has meaning if you understand it. Like you can have the most beautiful painting in the world, but it will have no value if it's not appreciated. Do you know what does have intrinsic benefit? Getting a job, avoiding wars because you don't understand what the other world leader was saying, ladies and gentlemen. So we think that in on the cost-benefit analysis, the cultural diversity can take a backseat. Secondly, in terms of the point of language, we think that the point of language is the ability to reduce distance between people who are incredibly and inherently diverse, right? So what we say is that making language uniform does not necessarily mean you completely let go of any kind of identity or diversity of ideas, right? Language is a vessel. It's a carrier of spirit. So we would argue that in linguistic theory, language carries spirit but does not dictate what you think or what you're going to say. So the best way to harmonize diverse, inherently diverse peoples is to be able to harmonize that language. Language carries humor. It carries your, it carries the ability to understand different cultural nuances. It carries the ability to share the same slang, for example, with somebody who is five oceans away. And the point of the matter is, it is just not feasible to learn every single language, ladies and gentlemen, right? This is what they seem to say. If you recognize that the world is globalizing, and if you recognize that it is a value that people will come together, then the question is, how will people ever come together on your side if, unless you want everybody to turn into a polymath? We think that the problem is worse on their side. If no one understands what your ideas are, then it doesn't really matter what your ideas are in the first place, right? And that's why it's important to bring those ideas together. We think that's a rationale behind even the ESL and EFL categories, that it's possible to impose English, but create room for respect and diversity and allow for all voices to be heard, ladies and gentlemen. Because we will argue that real-time structures change when you institute a societal change. And this is where we dilute all the argumentation coming from opening opposition about logistical challenges, right? Which we think was quite nitpicky. Because obviously, once you institute English as your main language, the access to English will also change. You're going to shape English education and shape your curriculum to try and teach English better to students. You're no longer held back by tr backward tribal mentality that I should preserve this cultural diversity for some amorphous value that they were never able to prove. But the second thing is, even beyond structural access right to English because now it's in your main language and it's more lucrative to learn English we think that English no longer becomes a tool of white colonial masters it can be a tool for everybody so this is how we overcome the logistical challenges that were posed to us coming from opening opposition which is a significant part of their speech anyway but let's really talk about why these real-time structures need to change right it is because ladies and gentlemen when you talk about language the need to harmonize it is so great when you talk about in politics negotiation between world leaders you don't 
need translators anymore. And that's great, right? Because now George W. Bush won't misunderstand. I mean, Trump won't misunderstand um, Kim Jong-un if he says he wants to launch a missile, but actually he just wanted to host a Sunday dinner party, ladies and gentlemen. Or in terms of domestic politics, right? When it comes for the Philippines, for example, we have multiple dialects in our country. And domestic politics is really hampered because national politicians only speak the language of the capital. When you harmonize everyone's language across the board, you're able to make sure everybody's able to learn. Moreover, in academia, when you talk about knowledge transfer, if that's what you really want, there the Infocore were translated from the French, right? We think that is a concession, that you need to change structures to be able to allow people to access that knowledge in the first place. Or even in terms of commerce, right? To be able to gain a job. Why will a foreign direct investor, it's harsh to say, but why will he invest in you if he thinks he won't be able to understand you, right? Why will he engage in negotiations with you if he thinks he won't be able to understand you? So we think being able to harmonize people in a globalized world is absolutely important or else you will always need mediation on your side. You're always going to be lost in translation. Opening. Even how often one was given up their lives with a better job. Why should I be the one to tell you not going to see you post on there rather than post objective liberty Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be able to accept that there will always be birthing pains when you try to impose something, right? But at the end of the day, we need to be able to look at the trade-off. And if the trade-off is a better quality of life for everybody, if the trade-off is your ideas as a human being being able to come about for everybody, then we think that's something we would rather have on our side. So, why does that global language need to be English? Number one, in terms of access. And this is where we separate from opening up government, right? When you look at language, uh, English, it's a phonetic alphabet that lends itself to romanization. We think it's easier to learn 26 letters rather than the 2,000 ideographs of the Chinese language, right? In fact, right now, the trend in Chinese, Korean, and Japanese education is translating those ideographs into pinyin and hangul and romaji, ladies and gentlemen. That is already a concession that we need to move towards a way for people to understand each other and for our people to understand, like, move towards a universal language. It's not enough to merely stop at romanization. It's important to be able to move past that and be able to come together. English is also a neutral toned language more than other languages that have more inflections. Secondly, English is also a more buildable and dynamic language. The Oxford English Dictionary tries, uh, like, is the most, is the fastest growing dictionary in the world, ladies and gentlemen. And that's because it allows for greater diversity and greater dynamism in the words you're able to use. But last trend is the emergence of accepted uh, accents, right? For example, Singlish, which are positive trends towards showing that English can shape itself to be relatable and to be, like, to be nuanced to so a particular, like, a cultural diversity. That's what you really want to happen. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to do is to make sure that people are able to access language and people are able to harmonize languages. That's the best thing to do for the entire world and for all nations. Thank you. We think it's important that in God's world, to opt into international commerce and experience any measure of success, you have to use the language that British soldiers cried before they raped your grandmother. You have to use the language that British soldiers cried before they slaughtered your brethren. That is not the world I want native, um, native individuals to have to live in. What has happened in this debate so far? OJ has taken a broad narrative of how languages should primarily be treated as a form of utility. CG wants a global language and gave us the linguistics class. I don't know if that's true or not, I don't think linguistics, but why language, language English is the particular unique form of language that used for particular circumstances. CO will enter this debate by telling you that colonial societies wrecked by imperialism Adopting the language of your oppressors is akin to the suicide and premature end to your prospects as a nation. Two things in my question. One, the principal argument in our extension, and two, native languages as a form of utility. So one, on the principal argument. Our stance is that we think it's morally abhorrent for colonized nations who ex no, thank you, who experienced the brunt of imperialism to adopt English. Let's look at the principle first. Here's the reality. The vast majority of the countries that we're talking about in this particular circumstance have been colonized by the British. I'm sorry, white people to the right of me. These are nations such as Gabon. These are nations such as Malaysia, Faroe Islands, for instance. These are nations that Britain has particularly ventured into. Second, let's identify particularly what languages mean to people. Let's just make it very clear. I think it's disgusting that government side can run away with the idea that language should primarily be treated as a form of utility. We think these people derive immense benefits from seeing language as a form of the identity and, partic and, and, and to, particularly to them, right? But how do we extend from all in this particular circumstance? 
One, we think oftentimes, the specificity of your language is oftentimes spiritually tied to how you identify yourself. This means Bantu Nigerians, for instance, use their language to pray their own, to their own particular gods. This means yeah. Amazonian tribes use their own Tekosi language to, to use their own language to praise the trees. These people end up using spiritual, uh, their own languages to derive spirituality for themselves. And we think that's incredibly important insofar as it leads to their own self-actualization as identity. But two, oftentimes, these things are often born through generational culture. This means that it's oftentimes disseminated by your grandparents, by your grandmother, telling you, singing lullabies in your native languages. We think that in and of itself is something that we must absolutely prize in this particular debate. This is tied wholly to culture, independent of utility. No thank you, sir. What happens when you use English, uh, 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 the language of those who colonize your people? Given the visibility of English in their world, recognize one. People have very little ability to opt out. Given that in their particular circumstance, opting into English necessarily means the difference between employment and unemployment. That means that individuals on the ground have very little ability to opt out to begin with. But two, recognize that you force individuals to use the language the oppressors use as cries of war before they engage in battle with your parents, ladies and gentlemen. You use the oppressors use to plunder the resources of your nation in the guise of favorable trade liberalization, ladies and gentlemen. We think that's incredibly, incredibly bad. And it's abhorrent that their policy creates that. We think this is principal argument and we should pass independent of the consequences. And this is also how I respond to CG. Because they will contend that people's culture should be perceived as a form of um, utility, right? But they don't realize that not everyone views success as a form of utility. Do you think that American, um, we think that native tribes, for instance, would rather preserve their language and preserve their cultural development rather than experiencing and opting into the international arena? They ignore that the point at which you allow English to date and allow other languages to necessarily degrade what in me, what your language means to you, that's when their ability to control what their language means to them is incredibly, incredibly uh, detrimental. No thank you, sir. Now, for the older judges who don't buy that principle, I have massive practical outcomes here. Recognize that in post-colonial societies where anti-colonialist rhetoric is incredibly strong, this debate, uh, sees Oh, then takes this debate. What happens? One, oftentimes, these places have fresh sentiments uh, directed toward colonialists, right? This means that people oftentimes will feel immensely alienated at the point in which they have to opt in to opt into the international arena. What does this translate to? This translates to forming rebel groups. This translates to rebelling against the government who has forced you to adopt the language of your oppressors. That's when you ensure that post-conflict nations never prosper given the right ethnic tensions that exist. This is by far the most important thing in the debate. No, thank you. Because the comparative is a confluence of minority languages who don't feel as if the government is necessarily compromising their identity. Second, is, um, second thing that happens, given that in post-colonial societies, these oftentimes are places with very low amounts of education and very weakened institutions of democracy, you reward the most privileged of society to prosper. What does this mean? This means that you reward those who are privileged enough to get scholarships to go to Harvard, Oxford, etc., where they were able to adopt English language maybe 50 years ago. The average middle-class man in Gabon, for instance, does not have a good command of the English language. What happens then, ladies and gentlemen? Given that the privileged dominate, one, you lose an entire generation who is never able to opt in in this particular circumstance. But two, also, this, given that people are able to dominate commerce, these are the people who end up being able to um, apply for business licenses in the international arena. These are the people who end up being able to start businesses, build oligopolies. That's when there's far more social stratification on the death side of the house. The comparative is there's leeway for other nations' language to be used as forms of commerce. Our worst case scenario is they rely on interpreters. I don't really give a shit. If it, if it takes like an extra one or two days, what does it really matter, ladies and gentlemen? This is by far the most important thing to debate. Because you condemn these nations who want some form of identity to do. I'll take opening. In either world, you're learning language on an oppressor, either in the form of colonizer or in the form of the dominant majority. Like, without adopting English universally, how else do you remove cultural and monosyllabism that makes people treat others like aliens and stops them? Sure, sure, so sure, sure. We disagree. We think that people can still be able to identify themselves and still opt into commerce by identifying their own native language. We don't think it's that big of a deal in this particular debate, given that interpreters and translators naturally uh, act as a mediator in those particular circumstances. Second, native languages as a form of utility. OG says they want people to be able to access knowledge and it's imperative, uh, in, imperative in, insofar as it allows these people some form of knowledge. One, right? Just I already told you that interpreters and, ver and their variations of journals in this particular circumstance, right? Harry Potter is literally translated 97 languages, I don't think that's big of a deal. But two, and I think this is the bigger question in the debate, because recognize that this debate is a comparative 
Between poor people being forced to accommodate the rich, poor people being forced to learn English language, as opposed to the rich and privileged being able to accommodate the poor. I think that is far more important. I think that in this particular circumstance, we have to prioritize, prioritize the weaker parties in this debate. We have to prioritize the poor, underprivileged individuals who are never able to opt into English to begin with. We think that their side of the house necessarily has, uh, necessarily has those harms, and we think our benefits, insofar as they don't have to, they're not forced to opt into, into those languages, is far better. Before I end my speech, I want to thank those who have helped me fulfill my dreams. Mubarak, Mayor, Sarah, Sharif, Shitab, and of course, my beautiful, beautiful partner, Sridi Basri. For the last time, IE3 is very, very proud to host the of Asia. The Nordi Matam era was the book that sparked the Philippine Revolution. For the longest time, it was understood only by the people within our borders. But once it was translated to English, the world finally had a chance to turn their heads towards us and listen. Ladies and gentlemen, the benefits of adopting English do not just go one way. What Tat explained to you was that the benefit is also that you can now translate your culture into something that is understandable to the rest of the world. We recognize that there may be some level of historical baggage, but we think what is more painful is if you are continued to be left behind because nobody can understand your culture. So what am I going to do in this speech? First of all, let's tackle the issue of what is least exclusionary and explain why that is government bench. Second, assuming this debate is about the preservation of culture, I'm also going to explain why we win that on government bench. But third, I'm actually going to be the one to weigh this, as Kat already did in her speech as well, and explain to you why even if we have to choose like economic mobility and all those tangible benefits over the preservation of culture, our side will win. So first, let's tackle what is least exclusionary. Let's re-explain where this debate exists in the timeline. The motion says we want to adopt, which means this motion exists in status quo. And in status quo, we need to assume two things. That one, there is already an inequality between nations, that there are rich nations, there are poor nations. And second, there is already a huge shift towards a world without borders, which means economies are increasingly trading and people are emigrating to state from state to state. The question of this debate now is, what are we going to do about it? So, inequalities exist across the world. The problem with OG in this debate was that they never really explained why the state needed to adopt it versus relying on natural incentives and, learn and people learning it on their own. So CAP provided the mechanism to the benefits that they laid out in their speech, and we think that's significantly more important in this debate. What are the three things she mentioned? First, why did it need to be a state policy? Because state policy ensures the democratization of the access to the English language. This means that even if you are a poor person from the rural community, you are now able to access jobs and opportunities. You can be hired to call centers because you can now speak the language. And this is because it is added to the curriculum. You are required to learn it in schools. And if we assume there's public education as well, people are now more able to learn it. We agree that we're not going to teach it to everybody. But if you look at likelihoods, it's still a great, like, significantly likelier on our side. But secondly, learning it on your own is not enough. So look, right? In debate, we all speak English. But there are a lot of words I didn't know until I learned to debate. Like, who the heck says mutually exclusive in real life, right? <laughs> what we say is that for you to be able to enter the world of commerce, politics, and the academia, you also have to be able to speak their language. And the colloquial words that you use are not enough to enter that sphere. If you learn it through the curriculum, you are able to learn and deepen your vocabulary. You are more, you look significantly more credible to people who hire you, and it's much, much easier for you to enter those spheres, fears and death opportunities. But third, understanding each other. We think OG's analysis ended up empathy, but what exactly does that really mean? Kat says, sit. If it's true that, it's, that language carries culture and culture is necessary to bridge gaps, then we think the best way to bridge people from distances all across the world is to show them that they have the same experiences. And that's brought by the humor involved in the English language, the slang that you have in the English language. Like if someone across the world can understand pabebe, that's already great enough for me to be able to relate to them, even if that's a word that usually only Filipinos speak. The ability to empathize comes from the experience carried by language. And that's an exclusive benefit that Kat talked to you in this debate. But why is it significantly better than their model? Because if you look at it, their burden, they wanted to defend the preservation of language. On to the second issue now. But if you really look at it, their side kind of dilutes their benefit as well. They say, to be, they say that
that one, you want to be able, you want everybody to learn every single language in the world, which we say is quite infeasible, and we'll explain that in a bit. But secondly, they also want translators. If that's the case, that you want people to translate other languages, then your burden is also shrink because there are so many things that then can get lost in translation, right? You don't perfectly preserve culture. So even if they try to defend this, they never really explain why they defend culture in its purest form, which is what they wanted to do at the end of the debate. But why is preservation of culture significantly more likely on our side then? Look at this way. If there is a book in Filipino, if there is a book in Cebuano that people don't understand, what happens? People are less likely to want to preserve this. If you translate it into English, what happens? People use it. People cite it in different academic journals. People mention it in politics. People quote it in conversations. Like uh, speeches in worlds, right? People constantly quote Boseo and a lot of other speeches because everybody now can access it. Why is this important? One, you need people to be able to understand what it's saying, to have the interest to preserve it. But secondly, you want people with the resources to preserve it, to understand it as well, so they understand the necessity to understand it. And we recognize that maybe it did come from colonial masters, right? But why is it still okay on our side? Because if now you speak the same language, there is now an avenue for you to communicate to your oppressor. We think what's worse, if you are constantly alienated and left behind, because they cannot understand what you're trying to say. If, you're, if you continue to stay in small bubbles, it's more likely for them to never preserve your culture, and it's more likely for it to die out as people continue to emigrate from your community to communities that are majority English, uh, majority English speaking. But why is this infeasible? We think if you realistically look at it, people cannot learn every single language that has ever come into existence, right? If realistic, psychologically speaking, it's only possible for people to learn two to four languages, to find short. You say that things will be lost in translation, presumably because those concepts and ideas do not present in the English language. Then you can see that entire ideas and concepts will not be able to be expressed in the English language. No, 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 no. What I was pointing out was, one, you don't fulfill your complete benefit. But the second thing I was pointing out was, even if that's the case, we say it's totally fine anyway. So, why is it infeasible? You have to preserve time, resources, and other priorities at, in your life, right? Which means it's impossible for you to prioritize getting a job, moving somewhere else, and at the same time, also learning every single language in the world. Realistically, there are thousands, even millions of languages, and it's impossible for you to expect everybody to learn it. But last, why is it then more important for economic like mobility over like preservation of culture? First of all, right, coming from CAC, it is the most tangible benefit you can expect. They say some people may want to preserve culture, but that's not enough. First of all, the greater majority of people would rather per would rather get more economic mobility, so we protect the common good. But secondly, our side is the more objective benefit. The reason why you want economic mobility is, it, is because it gives you access to a greater number of choices. That's something that the preservation of culture will not always uh, that will not always promise you. This means if you have education, you can get a job, you can make friends, you can move to another country. But that's something the other side cannot offer you. So because we wait and even try and co-opt to their benefits, we think that CG ought to take this away. Thank you. Panel. In both worlds, if you want to create a better bridge in the world of academia, commerce, or politics, you one party need to accommodate to another. Site government today's debate dare to tell us the ones that need to accommodate are those who are less privileged. They are the ones who have to learn English when they have the least ability to accommodate. And they dare to also tell us that these people are also the ones that need to subscribe to the language that is also used to oppress their grandfathers yes. and their previous generation. We think that's abhorrent. We would prefer that these people who have the ability, who are more privileged, be the one that accommodate to those who cannot speak in English. But understand that even when we said that, that does not mean that they have to learn all language in the world. That's not true. We think that is a false characterization brought by site closing government. We think they just need to learn the language that accommodates that specific community that they want to. For example, you have West businessmen who learn Mandarin because they want to trade with Chinese uh, with Chinese business people. We think that is still something that is possible in our world. The biggest problem that is brought by site government in today's debate was basically, I'll take you after this, 
The biggest problem that was brought by site government is basically the inability to relate, the inability to have empathy and no command, co commonality, right? We don't think it's true that language is the only thing that can break barriers and create understanding and respect. We think there are other things that can bring people together, things like nationality or religion that can also unite people. And there's no analysis why that's not enough. But even if we question, why is it necessary for you to unite people on a whole global scale? We think we're fine with people being different. We're yeah, fine yeah. with them having their own identity because you see, this identity is what provides them comfort, belongingness that makes their life meaningful. I may not be the best English speaker in this room, but I can be the best Malay speaker in this room. I will feel like I belong somewhere and I have a value. And we think that's why it's important for us to preserve that identity and that culture, that site closing is so quick to trade off and we think that's harmful. But even if we think that all people are different, that does not mean they don't have empathy or respect or ability to cooperate with each other. We've seen how white people being empathetic to the BLM cost, men being empathetic to the female cost. We think people can still cooperate at the same time, keep their identity and keep their language. And we don't see why that's only exclusive in their world. And, we also, and that also brings down the whole analysis on empathy that Mika wanted to talk about. So let's take a look also at the benefit that they brought. Notice that the government's benefit will only work if they're able to prove that everyone will have equal good access to a strong command of English language. No analysis has been given as to how they can do that. Perhaps they can fear that these countries have ability to teach people, but they can't fear that everyone will be able to converse in English overnight. Everyone will have strong command and equal ability to always access English language. We think there will still exist a generation of people who are going to miss out on opportunities in academia, on politics, because they can not learn English immediately. And these are the people who are going to be on a losing end. We don't see how they protect those people. And we think it's not someone that they can just easily ignore, right? First question, right? Why is the voice of the people is going to be less likely heard? This is directly engaging with site CG. Let's break this down, right? In a world whereby expectations is placed on non-English speaker to be the one that crossed the middle line, to be the one that accommodates to like English privileged people, we think it's also the world whereby those privileged people are going to make less effort in trying to bridge the gap. And we think that's harmful because they are the one with most ability, most resources in trying to reach out to others. That means in the hour they will have less effort to translate certain knowledge that could reach people that cannot necessarily speak perfect English. Less effort for them to learn another language and keep practicing those language to preserve it. There's also also, that, that, that also means like less limelight to other language that also needs to survive. In that world, we think more people are going to have difficulties in trying to opt into economic opportunities because first, they need to make sure they are able to master a certain language before they can actually get into those opportunities. If anything, we think voice is going to be less likely heard in, uh, in their world because, you know, in a world whereby people no longer see the importance of uh, practicing their native language, there is also the world whereby you reduce the number of people who can understand that native language. That means for those who choose not to opt into English language or people who are alienated, as Carl has already brought to you and not dealt with by any of the speakers uh, inside government, is that these are the people who will be locked out. These are the voices that you cannot hear and understand that this is the voice that you need to hear most because they need the most help. What you essentially do in your world is that you reward those who are most privileged, those who already have ability and experience to economy and we think that's a harmful world to live in. And speaking of that, we would like to address again the principle that was brought in today's debate that they don't want to engage with. We see that adopting the language of the colonizers basically make all the sacrifices that your previous generation brought in today's debate pointless and we don't see why that's a fair trade-off for you to take. If you are a minority, if you come from a country that is not well off, sometimes your identity, your history, the beauty of it is all that you have left. That what makes That is what makes you unique and what makes you feel Special. We don't think that's something that they should easily Why? remove. Opening. Why is it fair in your world to convince the vulnerable people with a false hope that you romanticize your own language, you'll be able to achieve all the opportunities in the world? Why don't you teach them English in our we the think rich are learning English and becoming solvent anyway? We think in your world you also romanticize to them the idea of me learning English means I will have access to all opportunities when you know in the first place they're not going to get that equal access. But also understand that in our world whereby you make these people, where you, by you make those who are privileged try to accommodate to those who are not privileged is also the world whereby you include more of these minorities and we think they do have incentive to accommodate because they want to tap into more markets, they want to tap into more voting blocks and they, will just, they just want to tap into uh, more, uh, more knowledges that have nuances. But on to the other part of the debate, right? When it comes to the preservation of culture, I just want to call out site closing when they said that you can preserve culture better when you speak it in English. In the same breath, they were talking about translation means you are going to lose certain meanings, certain important nuances of that, uh, of that 
particular culture. We don't think it's possible for them to make sure they can preserve the culture at the same breath says that translation is only going to make it less meaningful. Also, we think people won't have any incentive to practice any part of your culture if it's just in another, if it's just in another average English language. We think your language makes it, uh, makes it unique. But also, uh, but last thing that I wanted to point out is that on our extension, they did not engage with the part whereby in their world, when some people feel, when some people have fresh sentiment against colonizers, these are the people who are going to alienate themselves. These are the people we, we pose to you the bigger harm in today's debate. Right? It is not just a matter of accessibility that those of the, those who are more privileged can provide. But the bigger problem is that when these people alienate themselves, that's when you lose people who are important. That's when these people are going to get most harm. That's when instability is going to happen in, in areas of like post-conflict or areas whereby they still are against their colonizers. We think it's about time we take a look at the bigger picture and understand that submitting to the colonization of language is not going to bring any benefit to those who need it most. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.